Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Stories Podcast. This week, by popular demand, we have another Max Goodname story entitled Max Goodname and the Song of the Basilisk. If you want more Max Goodname, you can find his books on Amazon. Just search for Max Goodname on Amazon.com or visit storiespodcast.com slash max. Enjoy! I gotta admit, buddy, said Wallace Q. Wallace, it looks pretty sharp. It's perfect. The pair were standing in the king's castle, looking at Max's new armor. As promised, the king had made him a full suit of solid steel, shined to a bright silver color. It was a work of art, and to add the final flourish, the queen had her seamstresses stitch Max's surcoat that bore his new siglia, a sword over crossed wands. With this on, you'll be able to take quite a beating, buddy! Max winced a little at the thought. He had only just finished recovering from his injuries sustained the joust. Having clerics work their spells was great for broken bones and lance splinters, but there wasn't much they could do for a body full of aches and bruises. Well, the king said he had a job for us, so I should get a chance to try it out pretty soon. Sooner than you'd like, I imagine, said the king, coming into the chamber. Max and Wallace both dropped to their knees and placed their fists to their forehead as a sign of respect. Your, Your majesty, majesty, they said in unison. Stand up, the both of you, the king said. You're members of my court now, and if you drop to your knees every time I walk into the room, we'll never get anything done. He crossed the room to look down at the armor, running his finely manicured hands over the bright steel. A solid suit for a solid knight. The royal blacksmiths did a fine job. See that you don't let the basilisk do too much damage to it, or to you. I'd hate to have to replace a suit of armor and a knight. A basilisk? You're sending us up against a basilisk? Is there a problem? No, no problem, said the young wizard sarcastically. Just two stories of claws, beaks, poison, and oh yeah, a gaze that turns men to stone. It might as well be a picnic. Well, if you're not up for it, perhaps you weren't ready to be a court wizard after all. Wait, wait. Just what exactly is a basilisk anyway? A basilisk is a cousin to a dragon and a brother to death itself. They're part rooster, part snake, and they have all kinds of magical powers. Max swallowed hard and looked at the king. Is he right? Are they that bad? The king looked Max in the eye and laid a hand on his shoulder. I'm afraid they're quite a bit worse than that, even. But Max, you have to believe that I would never send a knight on a quest I didn't think he was capable of. Besides, you two won't be alone. You're to meet a cleric's guild at the edge of the deep wild forest. Corley, Max whispered, thinking of the beautiful cleric for the thousandth time since the tournament when he had last seen her. Perhaps, said the king with a little smile. I don't know who they're sending, but it was they that requested I lend support for this quest. The basilisk has been turning travelers in the deep wild to stone, and the clerics don't have a cure. They need to discover the secrets behind this terrible beast, so that they may set to right those that have been cursed by its strange magic. Strange magic? asked Wallace, suddenly interested again. Of the strongest kind, replied the king. That's why they requested a pair. A wizard to deal with this creature's sorcery, and a knight to shield the cleric, and to slay the beast, if it should come to that. We'll do it, won't we, Wallace? We sure will said Wallace, eyes bright at the prospect of unknown magic. We won't let you down, your majesty. I know you won't, because if you fail, the basilisk may well claim your very lives. On that note, he turned and left the room, leaving Wallace and Max to stare at each other with a mixture of uncertainty and excitement, and it should be noted, more than a little bit of fear. They left for the deep wild forest, sun up the very next day. Well, what they imagined must have been sun up. Truth is, it was raining so hard that only the faintest trace of light was able to shine through the soupy gray clouds. The king had lent them a pair of horses that knew the trail for the trip, so they didn't have to do much more than hold on and occasionally guide the amiable beasts with a cluck or a swish of the reins. Wallace rode cloaked in his voluminous blue robes, hiding from the rain, nothing but the tip of his long nose sticking out. Max had on a long black traveling cloak and hood, his armor packed up tightly in a bag on the back of his horse. 
They tried to talk a few times, but the steady roar hiss of the rain made it impossible to hear, and after a bit they gave up and resigned themselves to riding in silence. After most of a day's miserable riding, they finally began seeing traces of the deep wild. The small bushes and shrubs that dotted the trail came more frequently, grew taller and wilder with strange berries that Max thought looked delicious, but Wallace warned would give a man terrible stomach aches. They did pass a few apple trees that Wallace declared safe, and the pair picked a few ripe ones from the saddle as they passed. Finally, the edge of the deep wild forest crept into view, the trees so tall and densely packed that no rain managed to filter through. It was under one especially large tree that they spied the white pavilion tent of the clerics. Eager to be out of the rain, Max and Wallace tied their horses under a dry-looking tree and pushed their way into the tent, and ran right into Corley. Directly into her, and rather hard, too. The three fell into the dirt, rubbing their bumped heads and grinning widely. You always did know how to make an entrance, you two, said Corley, dusting herself off and helping the young questers to their feet. Good to see you, too said Wallace, already wandering off towards a bubbling kettle of stew over a warming fire. Say, what do you got cooking? Max smiled at Corley, and she smiled back shyly. After a moment, the two practically leapt into each other's arms for a big bear hug. I've missed you. It was too bad you had to leave right away after the tourney. I've missed you too. I didn't want to go, but once the king made me a master cleric, I had to go with the guild and be assigned to my new job. I know. Wait, new job? What's your new job? Yo, sir, hugs a lot, hollered Wallace Q. Wallace from his seat next to the stew. Come eat some of this before I make it disappear. Max and Corley laughed and stepped apart. Go, said Corley. I have a few things to do anyway. We'll talk after dinner. Max took the seat next to Wallace and helped himself to a bowl of stew. The cleric seemed to be a mix of masters in their white robes and apprentices in their silver. They were all being very nice, but none seemed all too eager to talk. Max asked Wallace about it. It's just the way their order is, you know. They're all warned about making too many friends because it becomes harder to work on their magic if they know the patient. I do my best work on friends personally, but then again, I'm the greatest illusionist in the world, so take it for what it's worth. Max laughed and dug into his stew. After they had eaten and the bowls and kettle had been cleared away, it was dark outside. The dozen or so clerics all gathered around the fire in the pavilion, crowding the benches around Max and Wallace. Corley slipped from the darkness and took a seat next to Max, giving him a little smile as she did. What's happening? Shh, you'll see, said Corley, nodding towards an empty rocking chair on the other side of the fire. As Max watched, an old cleric with a long braid of silver hair walked slowly into the tent. Her skin was wrinkled and spotted like old parchment, and her eyes were the pure white of new-fallen snow. One of the apprentice clerics took her by the hand and led her to the front of the rocking chair. Welcome the mother, the keeper of lore. Welcome, Welcome the mother, the keeper of lore. lore, the other clerics replied solemnly. The mother took her seat in the rocking chair, her braid pooling in her lap. Mother, we have two questers who seek your knowledge to aid our cause. Welcome, questers. What do you ask of the mother? said the mother, her milky white eyes rolling over Max and Wallace. Max felt goosebumps stand out on his skin as the mother's gaze fell upon him. He realized then that all the clerics were looking at him, waiting for some response. He didn't know what it was, though. Was he supposed to know? Mother, said Wallace, we seek a song of truth, sung by Faith's own voice. The mother smiled. So the wizard knows something of our ways, then. Wallace smiled back. It's a wizard's job to know the lore and the rituals of the land, though I would never presume to know as much as you, fair mother. One day, wizard, if you're lucky enough to live as long as me, I sense a greatness in you. Her eyes turned to Max again, and they seemed to burn into his body. In both of you. A silence hung in the pavilion for a moment, broken only by the crackle of the fire and the slow creak of the mother's rocking chair. Very well. Who will stand for these outsiders? I, Corley Anders, will stand for them. By skin and stone, by blood and bone. I do swear their virtue. Then by skin and stone and blood and bone, let us sing to them. What song would you hear, my wizard and knight? The song of the basilisk, breathed Max. The mother was silent for a long time, and when she spoke, it was nearly a whisper. That is a song of danger and doom, and heroes long forgotten. 
I know my order has called you here to help, and I will sing you this song, but know that it is not sung lightly. As the mother prepared to sing, Max felt a terrible fear settle over him. Just when he thought it would stop his breath, Corley took his hand in hers, and through the simple magic of friendship, he felt the fear slip away. When a foul crow's his closing breath, with midnight hour's final chime, if moon is full with thoughts of death, and evil's born from out of time, an egg of scales like a sickly gem is broken soon, and with it peace, a laughing lizard who does condemn flesh and blood to stone and grief. A rooster head with rooster songs to raise the sleeper from its bed, serpents' tails and poison prongs to make the riser sleep instead. Father to toads and king of snakes, in a spider fear will instill, a bite will give you chills and shakes, but a single glance will make you still. After the last echoes of the song faded away, the mother was ushered from the pavilion to her own sleeping quarters in the back of a covered wagon. Corley led Max and Wallace out as well, and helped them erect their small tent, all of them working silently. So, said Max, when he couldn't take the quiet any longer. Now we know how dangerous a basilisk is, but how do we stop it? Max looked at Wallace, who looked at Corley. No one knows, Max. The mother knows where basilisks come from, but as far as we know, no one knows how to kill one. Dragons you can slay with sword and lance, but basilisks can heal from any wound. The last one recorded was over a hundred years ago, and no one knows how it died, or if it died at all. For all we know, this is the same one, and it's just been hibernating. They hibernate? asked Wallace. No one knows. That's the problem. But we'll find out. It's our quest, after all. Our quest? Are you coming with us? I sure am, Corley said with a little smile. That's my new job with the guild. I'm in charge of finding cures for unknown magic, and the petrifying stare of the basilisk is my first job. Not exactly easing you into it, are they? Asked Wallace with a little laugh. No, but the three of us will make a pretty good team, Corley said, hugging the two boys. If anyone can figure it out, I bet it's us. Now get your sleep. We leave at first light. She turned and went back to the pavilion, leaving Max and Wallace to crawl into their tent. That night, when he finally fell asleep, Max dreamt of being chased across a farm by an unusually large chicken. He dodged around giant kernels of corn, but it finally got him in its beak and gobbled him down, armor and all. And to think, he had once been nervous about a little jousting. When Max awoke the next morning, Wallace Q. Wallace was already gone. He dressed quickly and found the young wizard sitting cross-legged on a stump, eating a chicken wing hungrily. Chicken? For breakfast? Max asked rubbing the sleep from his eyes. Yeah, well, I figure a basilisk is basically an oversized chicken, right? So by eating a wing for breakfast, I'm winning a little battle with every bite. Max was too tired to argue with that logic, so he went and put on his armor instead. Wallace Q. Wallace soon finished his meal and helped Max with the trickier buckles and straps. When he was all locked in, he cut quite the impressive figure. He had always been tall, but the armor made him seem even taller and it hid just how skinny he really was. Wow, Max, you look like a proper knight. Is that real, or is this another illusion? She reached over and gave Wallace a pinch on the arm. Hey, what'd you do that for? Just wanted to make sure it wasn't your magic this time, <laughs> she said with a wicked little laugh. Max laughed with her, feeling suddenly sure of himself and the quest. It's amazing what a good layer of steel and a sword on your belt can do for your morale, he thought. Max thought the mother would be there to see them off, but she didn't leave the wagon. Some of the other clerics came and gave Corley quick hugs, but they paid no mind to Max and Wallace. So without much fanfare or ceremony, the three adventurers soon found themselves on a winding path leading straight into the heart of the deep wild forest and the lair of the basilisk. They walked for a couple hours with nothing but the normal sounds of the forest for company. Birds chirped, small animals chittered through the underbrush, and a myriad of different insects buzzed and droned on. It was enough to make Max bored, which made him start to lose his focus, which made him completely unprepared when the first of the snakes dropped from the trees and landed on his face, its fangs sinking deep into his cheek. Ah! Max yelled, and his companion sprung into action. 
Wallace drew his slender wooden wand from deep in his robes and rolled it through the air like he was playing an invisible drum. Fire leapt from his hands, and three snakes fell burnt from the trees. Corley recited a quick warding spell, and the two snakes that tried to bite her were slowed like they were trying to swim through maple syrup. By that time, Max had found his feet and drew his sword with a steely ring. He stomped the snake that bit him under his metal boot and cut through the snake slowed by Corley. Max, you're bit. Let me look at it. It's, it's nothing, said Max, but his eyes felt very heavy and a nap seemed like just the right idea. While Wallace stood watch with Wand at the ready, Corley sang a quick healing spell she had learned especially for this quest. It was designed to remove venom from a bite, and it worked perfectly. While she sang, the poison dripped from Max's face and landed on the ground. After a moment, Max was perfectly healthy again, but whatever plants the venom touched withered and died. Strong stuff, said Wallace, poking a dead fern with his wand. It sure is said Max, rubbing his cheek. Agreed. So let's none of us get bit again, okay? Hey, it was only Max that was kissing snakes, said Wallace. Max gave the wizard a dirty look, but didn't bother replying. Instead, he put on his helmet and dropped down the visor. Sure, it made walking hot and uncomfortable, but it was a lot better than getting bit again. The trio resumed walking, and just when they were starting to wonder how they would know when they were nearing the basilisk, they rounded a corner, and the answer became all too clear. In front of them, amid the trees and bushes and wildflowers of the forest, was a garden of statues. There were knights with swords raised high. There were wizards with staves at the ready. There were archers with arrows knocked and drawn. And more than anything else, there were travelers with expressions of surprise and fear on their pale stone faces. Not statues, Max realized, but the victims of the basilisk. We must be close. Good. Now remember, we're here to watch and learn. Don't pick a fight with this thing and don't look it in the eye. Ah, you don't mean we can't play with the magical snake chicken? Asked Wallace sarcastically. Before Corley or Max could tell him to be quiet, a thundering rooster crow filled the air around them, followed by the dry shaking sound of a rattlesnake's tail. The three dropped into cover behind an old log. In the woods in front of them, not more than a stone's throw away, the basilisk slithered into view. It was uglier than Max imagined. The body was like the biggest snake he had ever seen, about as thick around as the body of a horse, and ten times as long, ending in a rattlesnake tail. The head was that of a white-feathered chicken, with beady black eyes and a razor-sharp hooked beak. To round out the terrible danger of the beast, it also had two short arms that ended in giant rooster talons, each one dripping venom like a snake's fangs. As they watched, careful not to look it in the eyes or make a sound, the basilisk slithered up to the nearest statue, a forked tongue flicking out of its beak, tasting the air. It must have tasted something it liked, because in one fluid motion it rose up on its talons and swallowed the statue, crunching the rock in its monstrous beak. The three friends watched in horror as the basilisk finished its meal and then slithered back into the darkness of the deep wild, to whatever evil hole it was calling home. Did, did you... Did, did it? It turns men to stone and then eats the statues, said Wallace. A more evil creature I've never known. Our quest is even more important now. We must learn all we can, and perhaps we'll find a way to slay the beast. I'll give it a taste of my sword, said Max, his voice thick with anger. Maybe good at healing, but let's see how it heals when it's cut in two. Don't be crazy, Max. It has scales like a dragon. No blade can cut it. Just look at... A hiss rose from all around them, followed by a rattle, and another and another. They looked up from behind their log and found snakes filling the trees above them. Their hisses and rattles grew in volume until as if in answer from the darkness of the forest, a louder rattle and a terrible rooster crow. It knows we're here, yelled Wallace, standing tall and drawing his wand. Max, you get Corley away. I'll meet this beast, magic to magic. Wallace, no! Go, said Wallace. It's your job to keep Corley safe, and it's mine to learn all I can about this creature's magic. What better way to learn than to meet it head on? With that, he began to trace an intricate design in the air with his wand, drawing strange letters in bright green fire that bobbed in the air like a ship on the sea. The basilisk burst from the brush, and Wallace started to shout, not in fear, but in defiance, a strange, ancient language rolling from his lips and giving life to his spells. Cron, Delore, Abago, Draconis! 
the wizard bellowed, and the green fire grew brighter still and lashed out at the basilisk in snapping, whip-cracking strands. Max, let's go, yelled Corley, tugging Max's arm. I can't just leave Wallace, Max yelled back. But even as he watched, the wizard's fire whip streaked across the basilisk's face, leaving angry red burns that healed instantly. Wallace, still screaming, raised his wand for another spell, but the basilisk dropped its head and opened its eyes and turned Wallace Q. Wallace to stone. No! Max shouted, but it was too late. The basilisk surged forward, snapping the stone wizard's wand as he passed. It took Max a second to realize the monster was now coming directly at him and Corley. Run! He bellowed and pushed Corley ahead of him. The pair started to sprint, branches whipping at their faces, roots threatening to trip them with every step. Just when Max thought they may have lost the creature, it appeared suddenly in front of them, beak wide open, eyes blazing. Max, no! yelled Corley, knocking the knight aside. She saved him from the stair, but that left no one to save her. Max pulled the sleeve of her white robe, but it was too late. It ripped free, and Corley got the stare of the basilisk full on. Before she could blink, she too was turned to stone. Corley! Max yelled, but there was nothing to be done. He wrapped the cleric's ripped sleeve around his eyes like a blindfold and plunged into the forest. Branches beat at his armor. Vines pulled at his arms and legs. Roots snagged his feet and turned his ankles. But still he ran. He ran because he knew if he didn't get away, he too would be turned to stone, and there would be no one to save his friends. Finally, after many miles, Max heard the sounds of birds chirping and small animals rustling. He had escaped from the kingdom of the basilisk but he almost wished he hadn't. Some night protector I am. Let my friends get turned to stone and run away? It should have been me. Suddenly, he heard a voice. A blindfolded knight, said a young voice. That's very silly, isn't it, sister? Maybe not so silly as it seems, little one, said another voice. Max drew his sword, waving it in the air defensively, still not daring to remove his blindfold. Who are you? Tell me now, in the name of the king. At ease, good sir knight, said the older of the voices, the one called Sister. We know who you are, and we know of your quest. It is no accident you found your way to us, even while blindfolded. What do you know, and how do you know it? Are you sure this is the right knight? asked the little one. He's so silly. I'm sure, little one, she said, and Max felt her draw closer, his body tensed for an attack. Relax, Max Goodname. We are the Deep Wild Fairies the tree talkers and vine walkers. We know you were sent with the wizard Wallace Q. Wallace and the cleric Corleanders to learn of the basilisk. Max sheathed his sword and pulled off his blindfold. The creatures in front of him indeed looked like deep wild fairies. They were small and finely featured, with green-tinted skin and wings of leaves and bark. The little one had a small weasel in her lap and was feeding it bits of berry. How do you know all that? The forest is but one creature. Every tree is an eye and ear, every vine and root is a guiding hand. We were listening to your meeting in the tent last night, and when you fled from the basilisk, we used the earth to guide you to us. Why? Why do you care? This forest is our home, and the basilisk is an abomination. It is poisoning our woods, befouling our groves and streams. It must be slain if there is to be harmony in the deep wild. Sounds good, but no one knows how to slay a basilisk. Even the lore mother of the clerics is forgotten. The little one giggled. Sister, sing the song. Sister, sing the song. The weasel squeaked excitedly in her lap, its little paws up in the air. Max looked confused. The song of the basilisk I've heard. You know that. True, but what you've heard is incomplete. The lore mother is wise beyond her years, but human years are nothing to a fairy. There is a fifth and final verse, an ending to the song and an ending to the basilisk. The end, an end, an end for our friend, sang the little one, taking the weasel's small paws in her hands and dancing in circles. If it's true, then will you sing it to me? Will you sing me the forgotten verse? I will, on one condition. Anything. You must slay the creature now, today, before it can do any more harm to the forest. The creature has turned my friends to stone, and I don't know if there's any spell that will bring them back. I will slay the basilisk the moment you tell me how it can be done. At that, the sister smiled. 
Once the monster is dead, we will restore your friends. That is an old magic, and one we know quite well. Max felt his heart soar. He still had a chance to save his friends. Then sing me the end, and quickly, and I'll make an end to the beast. The sister fetched a stringed instrument and sat on the ground. Max did the same. The little one and the weasel followed suit, and a sudden hush came over the forest. When a fowl crows his closing breath With the midnight hour's final chime If moon is full with thoughts of death And evil's born from out of time An egg of scales like a sickly gem Is broken soon and with it peace A laughing lizard does condemn Flesh and blood to stone and grief a rooster head with rooster songs To raise the sleeper from his bed Serpent's tail and poison prongs To make the riser sleep instead Serpent born and king of snakes A spider's fear it will instill A bite will give you chills and shakes But a single glance will leave you still To end the ender and unmake the king Seek the whistle to steal the crown And polished bride in silver bring A light to cast the shadow down A light to cast the shadow down A light to cast the shadow down So, said Max finally, A silver light and a whistle? What does that even mean? The sister smiled. The stare of the basilisk turns men to stone, but it doesn't have the same effect on itself. If you can bring a polished silver mirror and make the beast gaze into its own reflection, the magic in its stare will stop its heart. Great. Uh, I don't suppose you have a mirror handy. The sister looked to the little one, who giggled again. We can do you one better, said the little one, and scampered into the trees. She returned a moment later with a large bundle all wrapped in animal hide. Max took the bundle and removed the hide. What he found inside made him gasp with wonder. It was a shield, shaped like the leaf of a dogwood tree. The back was layers of sturdy oak, but the front was coated in a thin layer of silver. Max looked into it and saw his own amazed face reflected back. This is the silver shield of the deep wild. It is kept by us fairies until such a time when a basilisk is born. It's my responsibility to choose the knight to wield it, and I choose you, Max Goodname. Why me? There are better knights, stronger ones, and faster, too. The forest sings of you, Max. Not of your strength or your speed, and not of your skill at arms. It sings of your heart, and its song is beautiful to hear. Max hefted the shield and stood tall, testing the weight of it on his arm. I'll use it well, he said, and then he remembered the other line of the song. Now tell me about this wise whistle I must meet. The sister smiled, and the little one laughed and picked up her weasel friend. You hear that, Jeffrey? He thinks you're wise. Wise Jeffrey, the lord of the weasels. A weasel is a weasel? It is. It may seem strange, but the weasel is the basilisk's only natural enemy and the only thing that its snake army will fear. Little Jeffrey here is the lord of the deep wild weasels, and he will lend you his army if it means cleansing his woods of snakes. Max squatted down in front of the little one and the weasel and looked Jeffrey in his determined little eyes. Well, I guess a weasel army isn't any weirder than anything else that's happened today. What do you say, Jeffrey? Will you and your army lend me your paws? Jeffrey chittered and jumped from the little one's arms to Max's shoulder. Remember... The basilisk has to see its own stare in the mirror, so make sure you get right in front of it and hold the shield steady. Jeffrey, you keep Matt safe, the little one said to the weasel. You hear me? We'll keep each other safe. I won't let you down. The sister stood and gave Max and Jeffrey both a kiss on the cheek. I believe in you, brave Sir Goodname. Now go, go and slay the beast. In the dark heart of the deep wild, the basilisk stirred. It had an awful hunger and it was time for another statue to become its dinner. It slithered from its burrow in the thicket and clicked its razor-sharp beak. Which statue to eat? Which statue to eat? Usually it simply picked whatever happened to be closest, but not today. 
it remembered the fiery burn of Wallace's magic whip across its face and decided that a stone wizard would be just the thing to have for supper. It slithered across the grove until it came to the wizard. Such a skinny thing to cause such pain. He must have been a powerful wizard indeed. The basilisk flickered its tongue over the stone, tasting the Wallace statue, preparing to bite. It reared up, opened wide, and stopped. What was that sound? It was a high-pitched, chittering squeak, accompanied by a low yell. Strange, and it was getting louder. From the edge of the grove, Max Goodname burst into view. He was yelling a battle cry, sword raised high, and Geoffrey rode on his shoulders, screeching a battle cry of his own. The basilisk slithered back, letting loose a long rooster crow and calling his evil snakes to assist him. Suddenly, Max found his way blocked by hundreds of snakes in all shapes and sizes. Instead of stopping, he gave a cry of his own. And from the trees behind him, hundreds of weasels burst forth, screaming battle cries and running fast on their furry little legs. The snakes gave hisses of surprise, and then the weasels washed over them, attacking with blurs of teeth and claws, pulling down the snakes and opening a path to the basilisk. Max jumped over a pair of cobras and swung Parlo's old sword, cutting a black anaconda in two. He hit the ground still running, and the basilisk gave a great crow-hiss rattle of rage. It swung about to give the troublesome knight his lethal stare, but then it saw something that made its rage redouble. The silver shield! No matter, it didn't need its stare to deal with a single knight. It still had its lethal beak and poisoned claws and great coiling body. It squeezed its eyes tightly shut and rushed at Max, relying on its sense of smell to find the knight. Geoffrey chittered in Max's ear, the signal that it was safe to open his eyes, and just in time. The basilisk poisoned claws swept in, and Max knocked them aside with his sword. Then the creature lashed down with its beak, and he knocked it aside with the edge of the silver shield. Another claw strike from the other side this time, and another successful block with the sword. The basilisk faked another claw swipe, and Max whipped up his sword to meet it, realizing too late it was a trick. Instead, the heavy rattle-tipped tail of the beast crashed into his side, sending him flying into a nearby tree. Max sat up against the trunk, dazed. His sword had spun away out of reach, and Geoffrey was gone, but the silver shield was still strapped to his arm. The basilisk came for him, crowing loudly and preparing for a final bite, and Max noticed Geoffrey was on the beast's back, running over his scaled body and making for his head. Geoffrey! He called, hoping the brave weasel lord could hear him over the basilisk's roar and the commotion of the battle. Its eyes! Open its eyes! Did he hear? There was only one way to know. With his last bit of strength, Max rolled to his feet and raised the silver shield high. Come and get me, you overgrown chicken! He bellowed. The basilisk streaked towards him, coiled up its massive beak to strike, and then Geoffrey reached down from the top of the creature's head and sank his claws into his eyelids, ripping them open. The monster gave a roar that split rocks and splintered trees. But Max held the silver shield high and true, and with a final last crow, the basilisk fell fully upon him, crashing them both to the earth. It was a minute before Max was able to open his eyes again. When he did, he found himself staring straight into the eyes of the basilisk. He had a moment to panic, and then realized he hadn't turned to stone. That didn't make any sense, though, unless... The basilisk is slain! called the sister from her perch, high up in the trees. The weasel army gave a mighty cheer, and the snake slithered away, defeated. Geoffrey called to his weasel friends, and together they managed to pull Max out from under the dead basilisk, whose gaze was dangerous no more. Max found his sword, and used it as a crutch to get back on his feet. Thank you, Max Goodname, bearer of the silver shield and slayer of the basilisk. You are truly a great knight and friend of the forest. Max took a step and winced with pain. His leg was probably broken from when the monster fell on him, but he was getting used to broken bones. You don't need to thank me. Just save my friends. Of course the fairy agreed, and she moved very quickly. First, she plucked a feather from the basilisk's rooster head. Then she dipped it into the poison still leaking from the creature's claws and then she let a single drop fall onto the statue of Wallace Q. Wallace. At once, 
the poison started to eat into the stone, and after a few seconds, the lanky wizard was flesh and blood again, though the poison did singe off a patch of his hair. The same worked for Corley, and when she was told about the cure, she sent word back to the clerics camped at the edge of the forest. An hour later, and the clearing was full of white and silver robes, carefully administering drops of poison to all of the stone victims of the basilisk. "'You really did it, buddy!' said Wallace, when the three of them found a moment to themselves. "'You really slayed the basilisk!' "'Well, I had a lot of help. Sorry I couldn't save you two from being turned to stone.' "'That's okay,' said Corley, feeding a weasel a bit of jerky from her palm. "'You came back for us, and you helped me complete my quest. Thanks to you, we now know how to kill a basilisk, how to treat the victims, and that weasels are more than just adorable.' "'Plus, I got a new wand!' said Wallace Q. Wallace, holding up one of the basilisk's claws. Max still thought it was a little gross, but Wallace assured him that basilisk claw wands were among the most rare and powerful a wizard could have. I guess we make a pretty good team after all. We sure do, but next time you get turned to stone and I get to be the hero. The three friends laughed and laughed, and that's the story of their first quest, though it was by no means their last. The End Thanks for listening.